Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Jessel Podcast. Uh, my name is Ernie Raposa, and I'm here with Virginia Franco, a certified resume writer who's here to talk about building your story on your job search. Thanks for joining us here, Virginia. Thank you for having me. Oh, we're thrilled to have you here. Um, so, so why don't we level set a bit and just uh, get folks caught up with what your journey has been and what you're up to? Uh, talk a bit about what your your business does, and we'll go from there and talk about how uh, uh, people can leverage what we're what we learned today in their job search. Yeah, no. So, I my story is that I'm a complete accidental entrepreneur. I have always wrote resumes for friends since the dawn of day when I got out of college. I did not know that anyone did it for a living until um, I, my husband lost his job. I had gone from two to four kids and I needed to figure out what I could do to bring money without dying in childcare and discovered mm. that it was actually a career path. Um, so I started out by subcontracting with lots of different businesses that, that needed writers like me. And then um, when my youngest finally went to kindergarten, I launched full time um, and I help people get their story into their career marketing collateral, which is a resume, a LinkedIn profile, a cover letter. Um, I, I interview you, hear your story from Soup to Nuts, and then I get to work writing whatever you need. Okay, that's great. And and uh, looking at your, your profile and talking a bit, I saw one of your stats that you're one of 60... You have a certification that only yeah, 60 people yeah. in the world have? Yeah, there's a, half, there's a handful of different organizations that... We certify people in this industry. The one I got from the National Resume Writers Association is a hard one to get, um, and I'm really proud of it. Um, and it's called the National Certified Resume Writer. Um, but yeah. it, it it makes sure that you know the best practices and um, understand systems and you know, how to write for people, how to write to, to make sure that a, uh, applicant tracking software is going to read it, all of that. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And and do you have well, and, and so you you have this this process and the system that that you've been certified in. Do, do you have your own kind of Virginia brand that that you bring in into that experience that that yeah. you find works for you with working with uh, 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 job seekers? So one of the things that I am passionate about is making sure that everything I write appeals to someone, whether they're reading it in print or whether they're looking at it on their phone. And I feel like mm. that often gets overlooked. Yeah. Um, but in terms of, of, I guess my brand, I tend to work with people who have complicated stories to tell. Um, and that might be because they have been with the same company forever. It might be because they're making a change or it might be that they had a gap or the last few years didn't go so well. And they just, they need to figure out a way to, to, you know, address any elephants in the room. Sure. Sure. And, and just build that narrative around it. And, yeah. uh, you know, I, I'm in the tech sector and, uh, looking at resumes, uh, as, as both a hiring manager and an employee, uh, I see lots of resumes where it's just like, Hey, here's what I did. Uh, and, and you, 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 you read that and it's like, well, okay, but, but what did you, like, it, it's a job title, right? <laughs> here, here's what my oh, job right. title was, but what, what did you, like, what was a day in a life? What did you do? And, and right. how can you, how can you tell that in a way where you're not in the room with the person reading your resume? Um, and they're probably only giving it a glance, right? What what makes that pop, right? right? That's right. And so um, a lot of people make the mistakes of just sort of outlining what they did day in and day out, what the responsibilities right. were. And that doesn't really differentiate you from people. And it's not, it's not memorable. And so what I do is I focus on understanding your accomplishments. You know, what, what, what brought you to the role? What was the challenge laid out before you? What, what did things look like in the, before and what do they look like after? What was your role in that? And then let's try to put some data and some figures and some context around it. Um, and then what that does is instead of having 15 bullets that say what your role, what the responsibilities were, you've got maybe five or six bullets where the reader goes, well, while he was doing that responsibility, he did these things. And that's what I need done as well. Right. Right. Okay. Um, well, one of the things we talk about quite a bit with uh, job seekers uh, in, in our Jessel podcast is uh, the, the, the different uh, running that gauntlet, getting to that company that you see um, mm -hmm. you have, you have the applicant tracking systems where there's some element of artificial intelligence. And then there's the, maybe the screener, the humans mm -hmm. in, in there that are, are glancing at it. And then eventually you get to the hiring manager who has a, a smaller pile. Um, do, how, how do you, how do you approach the, there's that keyword element that'll get you through the robots. And then like, do you, it's almost like you need three resumes, but 
you generally can only submit one, right? So uh, what I remind people is that the applicant tracking software systems are really, they're a filing cabinet to help Mm -hmm. recruiters to sort through documents. There's no, you don't need to sort of beat the ATS. Um, You need a document that ATS can read correctly so that it can file it correctly. But there are live people on the other end reviewing these resumes. Um, and they rely on ATS to, to again, to file it. Um, but there are a couple key components that make a document an easier skim read because that's what we're doing with skim readers. And that, that first level screener will probably spend less than 10 seconds. But then by the time it gets to the hiring manager, they, they're not looking at 200 resumes at that point. They right. might be looking at 15 or 20. And so they may spend 30 seconds on them. Um, but the the components that I make sure to include in a resume really aren't that different from the components in a newspaper article. I I rely a lot on my journalism background to do the writing. Oh. Um, and when people, let me back up, when people are in a ru- rush, we all read documents the same way. And I love the news reading analogy because I think it a lot of people get it. Um, mm-hmm. Think about when you want to know what's going on in the world, whether you go to Twitter or a news site or newspaper, you know, we scan headlines. Right. Yeah. What's the headline? Yeah. Right. And then you read that first paragraph and then you might start jumping around. Um, That's the same way people look at resumes. So I've had a lot of success bringing those components into resumes. So I'll make sure that I have a headline that says, this is the role that I'm targeting. Uh, You know, I'm an astronaut. I'm a chef. I'm a financial services software developer, whatever it is. Then you have a paragraph that follows that says, this is why it makes sense to hire me. And you don't need to describe yourself with fluffy adjectives. What you can do is you pick out pieces from the job posting that it's clear that they need those sort of must have qualifications. And then you, you weave in a couple of sentences that, that align what they've asked for together with information about you. Yeah. Then you go into your experience and you, um, by keeping your writing concise, adding white space, space in between bullets, and not doing responsibilities, focusing on a handful of key achievements, you are allowing the document to be easier to skip. Okay. I'm actually taking notes here just uh, because I want to be able to to uh, <laughs> pop this up uh, for, for folks as, as key, key takeaways because it's just so important, especially for folks who maybe uh, are haven't done this in a long time or it's the first time they're in a search. Uh, yeah. and, and just, just to date this podcast, it's, uh, it's the, the end of January and we're still reeling with speaking of headlines every other day, some household name company is walking a bunch of people out the door. Right. Yeah. And, and it's a different dynamic. Well, it's a, it's a slightly different dynamic because we have so many folks now working remotely. Um, I was just reading an article about, uh, how people are getting laid off in their, in their living rooms. <laughs> right. And, and that's, a. a, a I guess it's a, di- a bit of a different dynamic than being physically walked out the door carrying your box, but right. still, right. It's, you're you lose that. Really yeah, 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 it's, yeah. It's inside and absolutely. So, absolutely. so when when folks are are processing that and dealing with that and then starting to build a plan to, it, it's very tempting. Uh, one one of the reasons we we got Jussle going is we saw that so many people were overloaded with, um, as they were looking for a job, they would just go down the whole list of, of everything on LinkedIn and hit easy apply button. And before they knew it, they'd apply to a hundred different jobs, right? Uh, and that throwing spaghetti against the wall is. is yeah. And, and, and especially if you haven't taken the time to really think about what it is you truly want and to build your narrative that, that is going to get you that thing, connect those two. Um, and, and I love how you, you started off the top around what's your headline. Uh, sometimes we ask our, our coaching clients, okay. like what, you're in a room with somebody like famous that you admire and or in an elevator for just a just a uh, your 30 second elevator pitch. Like if somebody said, well, what do you do? Who are you? Um, sometimes that that makes people's heads explode because they're like, I can't tell my story in 30 seconds. Well, you, you kind of have to to get that exactly. initial headline grab. Um, That's so, right. Yeah. yeah. And I, um, I, you know, what I've been advising, I'm sure you have too, with all of the layoffs is Number one, get your head around what just happened, sort of process it. I call it post-job loss disorder because it's real. Yeah, and yeah. if you haven't processed it, it will come out as bitter and angry in an interview. So you need to get to a point yeah. where you can speak about it neutrally. Um, yeah. Then get, you know, get a handle on your finances and then be really clear about what you want to do next um, and what your deal breakers are. Yeah. Uh, and so that allows you to then have a diversified job structure 
strategy that includes applying to the roles that make sense for you, talking to the com- people that you're interested in, that, that, that can help you to um, get closer to companies that you've targeted. Um, so you sort of reverse engineer. What do I want to do? Where do I want to do it? Who do I know that can get me there? Mm-hmm. What companies are posting roles online? Um, and that sort of diversified job search strategy to me is like a Disney World fast pass that gets you to the front of the line. Yep. Uh, tell me more about the the talking to people, right? Because net, networking is something folks don't always think about yeah. when they have a job, right? And and, and if you, you haven't, uh, what's a good way to potentially kickstart that on a job but search? So, you know, if you've lost your job, that's a perfect time to reach out to people. Um, yep. There's no shame in being laid off. Everyone gets laid off nine times out of 10. It's nothing to do with performance. And it's a great time to talk to people. And it doesn't, you're not asking them for a job, but you're asking them to find out what is once you have your target especially you can talk to people and say how did you make a pivot into this company can you tell me what it's like at this at this uh place what who are can you think of three people that i should be speaking with based on my target or mm-hmm. you know do you know anyone who works at this company so those words that what you're doing is you're now allowing people to help you and, and people do like to help you um but it's a lot of people get ashamed that they haven't reached out to people in a long time. They're embarrassed by that. Um, being on the other end where people reach out to me all the time, I love it when people reach out to me after a long time. And if I can help them, yeah. all the better. And they're not maybe not everyone's like that, but all you need are two or three people that are like that to then get you sort of further down the road. Yeah, um, yeah. I, when I, when I see that happen, I, I think of, I'm, I'm flattered that you thought of me, <laughs> right? that, that, that I can potentially help you. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and Tap into your alumni network. There's a lot of power. Yeah. You don't need. It doesn't need to be someone that graduated with you. It could be, but just having that shared university experience sometimes helps. Um, yep. But just by virtue of having probably been in more than one company, you probably know a lot more people than you realize. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't need to just tell friends. You can tell friends of friends, um, and just again keep keep that conversation going. Talk to three more people, three more people. Great. Good. Um, okay. And, and so, um, for folks who may be listening to this podcast, different stages of the journey, um, lots of questions probably bubbling up. Um, what would you say your, your, uh, number one, um, folks come into you, let's say off the street, right? Um, what would you say your, your number one challenges that, that people are facing when they come to see you? Um, they are, so I, I don't work with people when they don't have a target. I refer them to people to help them to figure okay. out what the next but once they have a target, they are just struggling with how to tell their story. Okay. Um, yep. When you've got 15, 20 years of experience, it is hard to pick and choose the relevant pieces. Yep. Um, and not everything's relevant. What you did if you mm-hmm. worked back in 2001 might be relevant. It might not be. And so I, it's important to sort of reflect back, figure out what you're proud of and balance it against is that based on the, this target, is it relevant for that to highlight that accomplishment? Yep. Yeah, because you may have done something 20 years ago that you are super proud of uh, and you have maybe an emotional attachment to, yeah. but someone reading it who doesn't know you and they're like, well, that was great, but not relevant to what we're trying to do here at our company. Uh, so be if realistic you, about that. Yeah. If you scooped ice cream at Baskin Robbins in 2001, that's not relevant to being a software engineer. <laughs> yep. Sometimes there's stuff that is relevant and it did happen right. a while ago. So I always... My goal is for a resume to be timeless and nobody needs to know how old or how young we are. Mm-hmm. And so if in pre-15 years, I create an earlier experience section, I'll synopsize what's relevant about that role and I'll just remove oh. the date spread. And then if yeah. it's super relevant, I will reference it in the branding at the top. I'll so, so okay. So, so you have, you, you have this kind of inflection point where it's where it starts to become more uh, job ag- agnostic. So I, I had this period where I learned X, Y, Z, or, yeah. or accomplish these. Whatever yeah. it is, it's maybe, maybe it's an accomplishment. Maybe it's that you cemented your skills here. Maybe yep. you just want to show that you worked at this big name company that's relevant to what you want to do. And so I will reference it. Um, yeah. And it, and it's again, but it's all depends on the target. So that informs and filters everything you write. Okay, cool. Good because insight. what happens, there's, I'm not always worried about age discrimination, but what happens to us when we see stuff that's much older than 15 years, we, we go into a rabbit hole. And, and what happens in the rabbit hole is we go, oh, I wonder if he knows this person who went to school with that person. 
you know, just all sorts of side nonsense enters our brains. And when you have 10 seconds to make an impression, I don't want three seconds spent in the rabbit hole. Right. Right. Okay. So, and even if, so let's say you worked at an impressive company, um, maybe, maybe list it, but don't take real estate on the page. Just yeah. say, Hey, I, I worked there. Right. You say, this is the title. This is the name of the company. And then if it is super relevant, then in the branding summary at the top, I'll say like strategies grounded in roles working for this, that, and then I'll list the name of the company that is on page two. So you're sort of teasing page two. Okay. Um, so, so here's a question that's near and dear to me. Um, okay. I, I, I hear a lot about the cover letter debate, right? And, and if, if, if you're, if you're applying in large volumes, <laughs> right, managing your cover letter for each one of those applications can become, that's a full-time sure. job in of itself. Uh, where do you stand in the the cover letter holy war? Uh, yeah, so I, <laughs> I, you're some people love them, some people hate them, and you yeah. can't make anyone everyone happy. So, in my anecdotal research through Twitter and LinkedIn, I <laughs> think they probably get tossed out half, if not more. Um, and so I tell people that if the posting or the if it calls for it, you better have it, yeah, because um, they're looking for it. Um. The other time where I do feel like it's really essential is if there's an elephant in the room that we need to discuss, like, why do you want to move to this industry after having done this? You know, um, it gives you a chance to sort of tell your origin story and explain that. Um, because what happens is if people have to connect the dots themselves, they often connect them wrong. And so yeah. this allows you to take control of the narrative. Um, um, yep. So other than that, I sort of tell people if you want it, great. If not, fine um but there's there's no downside to it it's just your it's your sweat equity right yep yep okay and um, honestly how how badly do you want that role right if it's just you right. something you saw in the middle of the night and you're like that looks cool right. apply um but right. if you see if you see your dream job um and then, then right. you cover all the bases right but if you have bypass sort of applying online as that first point of entry and you have yep both gotten closer to the hiring manager, talk to people, then you might not need a cover letter because they yeah. already are valid for you. You have that internal right. referral. Right. Right. That's true. Yep. So case by case. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Uh, what else tends to pop up for you working with, working with clients? Uh, one of the biggest things that I see, and I alluded to it earlier, is that people don't write for screen reading. Um, we read really differently online, and if you don't take that into account, it it makes it it makes the documents really hard. And when someone is in a rush and something's hard to read, you run the risk that they might skip it. So, um, and, and you said you said you said screen reading is that is it that... laptop desktop? Yep, okay. Um, you know, twenty years ago everything was in print. Ten years ago people used laptops, and now. People read a lot on their phones. Um, but with right. resumes, what happens is they mostly start out online, but then people do print it out um, down the road. The, the good thing, though, is that anything written for the screen prints out quite well. It's just that the reverse isn't true. Um, mm. We have a really yep. hard time absorbing text that is dense. That's why when you go online and you see those service agreements, when you buy something, it's like tons of little text and you just want to scream. That our eyes aren't designed to do that. Um, you know, we were trained to read as little kids where we start at the top left corner, go left to right, top to bottom. Mm -hmm. But online, we jump all over the place. And so dense text is really, really tough to do. So the good thing is it's easy to overcome. You just keep your bullets to two to three lines, and then you add space in between each and every bullet and paragraph. And that just lets the eye breathe. And it tricks the brain into thinking something's not hard. Um, because what happens is if you have like a five line paragraph on a, on a desktop, it's not tough to read, but on mobile, it becomes a nine line paragraph and nobody's going to read a nine line paragraph unless they have a ton of time. Um, the other thing that, because we do tend to jump around a lot, I always front load whatever I write, which means I put the good stuff at the beginning of the sentence because I don't know if the reader is going to get to the end. Mm -hmm. um, and then lastly, when people are looking at lists, online they tend to read the first thing and then the bottom thing and then stuff in the middle gets probably gets punted till later on um and so i'm very strategic in terms of ordering anything on a list any any list of bullets where the something super impactful is what they see first 
secondarily impactful in the bottom. And then say, you know, know that the other stuff might not get read until later on. Interesting. Okay. Yep. Yeah. I mean, it's where the eyes go to. Yeah. That's, yeah. So that's we cool. read top, yeah. bottom, middle, and then left, right, middle when we're reading like a bunch of, like a table. Oh, well, you know, Virginia, I have a bunch of technical training to take later at, at work and uh, they have uh, lots of uh, uh, SOP documentation, standard mm -hmm. operating procedure documentation, and it's lots of um, uh, big paragraphs of mostly text and I'm, I'm dreading it. Yeah. I have to do yeah. it. But um, may, may I can take some of that feedback and, and see if we can improve our, our yeah, training experience. That, <laughs> right. Don't call our high school English teacher because they would be very mad. But the um, it's very different from how we were taught to read back when. But it's, these are principles that apply to emails, to, to anything you write. Um, and with when because since you work with so much, so many tech folks, when someone is super techy, I will often have a technology snapshot at the top of the resume. And so then I have to list like, here's all the languages. Here's all the you know, operating system, like all, all of those initials and crazy yep. names, and stuff. but I keep in mind which ones are most relevant and I'll put those in the four corners of my list. Okay. Um, and, and I work with people too, who, who feel like they need to tell, like they're leaving money on the table if they don't squish their entire, like what they think is important into that. So it becomes a bit of a, uh, um, uh, uh, give and take around <laughs> what what is yeah. really important to make this concise and readable and and factoring what's in the, the human element. Need, yeah, yeah. Do you need what's relevant to this yep. role? The other thing that I should reference is when you're doing your own resume, it's I would I would encourage people to to go light on design um, because anything in a anything in a text or a, a text or a graph or a table, when you're applying online, not all softwares can read them correctly. So the human will read it, but it won't, um, you don't want anything, you don't want to send anything online that can't be read correctly. If mm -hmm. whenever I'm in doubt, um, if someone writes their own resume and they want to make sure that uh, software can read it correctly, I always tell them to convert it to a plain text document. And then you can make sure that everything, everything can be read. Because that's basically what, a what ATS does is it, it, Right, Correct. right, but Correct. yeah, but but with so many different systems out there, you don't want to run the risk of something, some special formatting confusing the 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 software. Yeah, yeah, there's almost yeah. 300 different systems. The good thing yeah. though is that they are getting more and more advanced. A lot of these issues aren't as great anymore. Yeah, what? It, oh, so Chat GPT is in all the news. Um, has anyone come to you and said Chat GPT wrote my resume for me? Um, no, but I did hear someone telling me, I heard through the grapevine that someone used it to improve their resume. Um, uh, I actually tested it out and I think it's a great tool to help people with cover letters and interview questions, but don't rely, just like with any tool, make it, make it an aid. Don't make it the only, the only source, you know, if you want to use it to, to get a rough draft and but then <clears> infuse <throat> it with your own stuff. Yep. We, we've actually used it uh, a bit. At Jessel, where we'll we'll take a transcript of conversations we've had, feed them into GP, uh, Chat GPT, and then it gives us a summary so that when we're talking about it, we're like, oh yeah, we did talk about that thing. So yeah. when we're we're giving a, because uh, we may have just forgotten about things if we didn't take notes. So we're finding we're finding value there. Um, and whatever yeah, tool will help you, just don't rely on it exclusively. Yeah, make sure yeah. human human touch and human oversight. What they say, AI is not coming for your job, but someone who knows how to use AI is coming for your job. Yeah. Right. Um, what, what about headshots on resumes? Uh, on resumes. Um, you need it on LinkedIn. If sure. you don't, people are going to wonder what's wrong with you. Um, and they will fill <laughs> it incorrectly. So no. on resumes, they are frowned upon in corporate America because people... Um, there's a potential for discrimination and companies are worried about appearing to do so. And so they don't want them on there. The, the okay. exception to that though, are um, like in, in entertainment industry, you need them sure. but by and large in corporate America. I don't, I don't put them on there. I don't think they're a good idea. I do put them on bios. Okay. And you do need them on LinkedIn. So. Yeah. I've seen even in LinkedIn now uh, uh, you can make your, you can make your, um, your headshot, uh, you can do a video pronouncing your name if you have a yep. difficult to pronounce name or a short little video message. 
step. I have one that's like 10 seconds and it just says, this is what I do. And your picture morphs into the video. Awesome. Yeah. 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 I'll play around with that. If, if you're comfortable talking about yourself, I think it's, it's, a, it's a differentiator. Cool. Okay. So, so you had talked a little bit about how you have other folks that you refer people to, to go, go talk to these folks, build your, build your story, ensure, you know, what it is you want. And then folks work with you on, here's what I need. Make it look right, awesome. Let's, let's yeah. your story <laughs> I did get it on paper, get it on LinkedIn. Yeah. Yeah. And and would you say those are our um coaches or like what 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 are what are the, the folks that you send people to? Like what what do you call them? Uh, they are um they're career coaches. Career coaches. And a lot of them okay. in career exploration. Okay. And you know, we've had we've had recruiters on here. Um you're our first resume writer. We're excited about that. Okay. Um but but you know, it's there are different folks that are doing different things along the job search journey. And you know, some of our recruiter friends are like, Yeah, I'm I'm really just I'm I'm on retainer for this company and they're a person I'm pulling in and, and they're they're trying to get me to coach them on how to do all these different things. And I'm like, Yeah, there's there's just so many that it's hard to find a one-stop shop where you have someone who is this unicorn of I'm a recruiter and a coach and a resume writer and all, all at one. And I think we all have some of those muscles, but you're not going to get that full experience without really tapping into those networks. People like I, I, I can coach, but I love the writing. So a lot of people sort of yeah. lean in more than the other, but it's job yeah. versus is, is, is a journey. There's lots of different places where it can break down. And so um, you sort of need to know where your job search is going wrong, I think, to determine where you need help. Because a lot of yeah. people come to me and go, I've had 15 interviews and I'm not getting the job. Will you work on my resume? And then I say, well, that's not your resume. Your resume is getting you to interviews. That's what it's supposed to do. You might need help with interview coaching. Right. So you need to look, right. you need to look at the breakdown. Yeah. And, and so you said you also do uh, LinkedIn profiles? Yeah. So it's funny. Yeah. A lot of people... People focus really heavily on keywords on resumes. To me, where you can really make a bigger impact is making sure that you have the right keywords or skills on LinkedIn, because LinkedIn is really algorithm driven. Um, it will there's there's you know people are on there searching for talent all the time, and so mm -hmm. keywords in certain places can really make a difference. Um, that's one of the parts of the equation with the with with LinkedIn. Like any social media, there's an algorithm and in addition to having keywords, it also wants you to be on there engaging. It also wants you to connect. You know, I always call it like sure. a, needy, a needy, a needy girlfriend or boyfriend. I want you to pay attention. <laughs> yeah. Um, having so there's three places on LinkedIn where having keywords can really it seems it seems to help with the algorithm um, in your favor. One is to make sure that the, there's keywords in your headline. Secondly, in the skills section at the bottom, and then the third piece is. Um, in your job title. So you have a hundred characters in your job titles. I always tell people to you know, write your write your job title, but then add keywords to it. Um, and LinkedIn has a great resume builder tool that you can type in your job, the job that you're interested in, and it will tell you the keywords that are that are in LinkedIn's database. Um, and if you have premium LinkedIn, you get to see more keywords than if you do the free. So it's worth it to me to just get the free just to do that for yeah, for 30 like days and, and thir get the right yeah. yeah, yeah, good. Um, right, yeah, and and, and gener generally your job search is a few months, right? Um, and and so there are lots of folks that ha that are out there that understand that and they like that are subscription based and they say use our services mm -hmm. for three months if you want to continue with it. Great, and like job scans, another one of those it sounds like similar capability to to what the LinkedIn resume builder I've does. Used job scan tools as well. Um, mm -hmm. What I like about LinkedIn is that I know LinkedIn is where people are searching. And so I want to make sure that the keywords align with what LinkedIn is, what people are using on LinkedIn to search, where job scan yeah. looks at a specific job postings. And, and companies sometimes call things slightly differently. Every yeah. company calls the same thing slightly different. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, and, and I've given that advice to, to clients of mine too, where just, just get into the conversation, even if you're just clicking and liking and um, just being on, just being on the platform, doing stuff raises yeah. your, your visibility. It's part of that part of this equation and there is so much you, you don't need to go and become an author and post but just commenting on people in your industry and you mm -hmm. can search on LinkedIn filters to find out who is in that space sharing their voice there's a lot of power in commenting yeah and, it's and, a way and you don't so what you only have to think of a couple sentences and well and I think you and I you and I are both premium um it when when I'm out there talking about different things I see 
nine out of 10 times, someone in that conversation thread goes and looks at my profile. And then yeah. if, if, if I, if I go and see who that person is, that may be a, Hey, I saw you, you know, it's a little creepy sometimes. Yeah. Like I saw you were looking at I me. Um, well, it's an all right. but you know what? I tell people use the 30 days of premium and look at who's yeah. checking you out and reach yeah. out to them and say, thanks for be, thanks for viewing my profile. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, it, and it could be someone who's in the industry you want to become part of. So, and it's not yeah, expensive. Yeah. It's like 30, 35 bucks a month or something. So it's worth it. Yeah. yeah, I knew uh, I had her on my podcast. She was a teacher that turned into a customer success manager and she just started posting about her day as a teacher while she was job searching and about the commonalities and started commenting on other people that had switched from teaching and she landed pretty quickly. Cool. Well, yeah. Virginia, we, we are actually coming up on time here. Uh, we could probably talk another two hours about this. And I'm just so grateful for you coming to, to chat with us about about this very important topic for uh, lots of folks out there, especially now. Um, any parting thoughts for folks who uh, may be just starting out their their search or are thinking about their next thing? Yeah, be clear on your target. Be clear on your deal breakers. Um, the last thing you want to do is jump out of the frying pan into the fire. So um, just having done that pre-work of what you want to do, where you want to do it, and who you might know, that's that is half the battle. And then make sure you look good on look good on paper and look good on the screen. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for the time. Have a great weekend. Today's Friday. So happy Friday to you. And uh, come back anytime. We'd be happy to have you come on panels or talk more about what you're up to. It'd be my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Virginia. Take care.